to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, and 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Beloved, what is your natural reaction when you hear a passage read such as Genesis 5? Boring. I would dare say, <coughs> boring. A long list of names and numbers, many of which are difficult to pronounce. And the Bible, of course, especially the Old Testament, is filled with such lists of names. And we are tempted to dismiss such information in the Bible as boring. But that would be a mistake. First of all, we believe that the entire Bible, every single word of the Bible, Old and New Testament alike, is inspired by God. But why has God included chapter 5 in the book of Genesis? It comes after chapter 4. Chapter 4 records for us the line of the wicked sons of Cain. And chapter 5 then records for us God's faithfulness in preserving his church in those earliest days through the line of Seth. Remember, Adam and Eve had children, Cain killed Abel, and then God continues his line, his covenant line, with the third son, who is called Seth. So we have in chapter 5 the list of all of the descendants, or most of the descendants of Seth, through whom God then preserves his Old Testament church. This is really, you could say, the earliest church membership list in the Bible. And of all these saints in the Old Testament, of these which belong to the antediluvian period, that is, the period before the flood, only three are included in Hebrews 11, which is that list of the great cloud of faithful witnesses. The first one is Abel. And Abel, remember, was the first martyr. He was killed by his brother Cain. Abel believed in the coming of Jesus Christ, who was the seed of the woman. He showed that faith by offering a lamb which pictured to us the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The second is Noah. And Noah, of course, straddles the antediluvian, the before the flood, and the post-diluvian, the after the flood periods. Noah is the one who built the ark, and whose family then survives after the flood to continue the Old Testament church. Uh, this morning, we look at the third, not in chronological order, we look at the third, that is Enoch. And of these three, Enoch is unique. His father was called Jared, or Jared. And he gives him the name Enoch, which means dedication. So we can see from this that his parents must have been godly. They wanted to have a son who would be dedicated to God, to the one true and living God. And we can see from the life of Enoch, as it is recorded for us very briefly in the Holy Scriptures, that his parents were not disappointed because Enoch was indeed <coughs> dedicated to God. In fact, he was outstandingly dedicated to God for he walked with God in closest covenant fellowship. And then Enoch has a son, and his son is very famous because he is the one who lived the longest, 969 years. He's called Methuselah. The name Methuselah means 
When he dies, it shall be sent. And thus Enoch, being a prophet of God, prophesied through the name of his son Methuselah that the flood God's judgment was going to come upon the wicked world. And in fact, Methuselah died the very year of the flood. He did not die in the flood, but he died the year of the flood. And Enoch was a man who was famous. He was famous among the godly. He was one of the pillars of that church in that day. He exemplified by his life close fellowship with God. And he was, you might say, infamous among the ungodly. The ungodly knew who this Enoch fellow was as well because, as Jude tells us, he was a preacher. He preached about the coming of God's judgment upon the world of the ungodly of that day. Noah was not the only preacher. Enoch was a preacher as well. And this, of course, caused great irritation and annoyance to the world of his day. And Enoch is famous for this as well. In fact, this is the thing for which he is most famous. He is the one man before the flood who did not die. We read rather in Hebrews 11 that he was translated, verse 5 says, that he should not see death. He is that one man before the flood who did not experience physical death. Instead he was taken directly up into heaven as a testimony to the fact that he pleased God. Notice then, Enoch pleasing God by faith. Enoch pleasing God by faith. Notice first his life, then his testimony, and finally his reward. If you compare the two passages of the Bible which describe Enoch in most detail, Hebrews 11 and Genesis 5, we have these two points. In Genesis 5, he is called one who walked with God. In Hebrews 11, he is called one who pleased God. Put those two together and we find this. He was one who pleased God in the way of walking with God. Walking with God is a beautiful expression in the Bible that denotes covenant fellowship with Almighty God in Jesus Christ. Now the word covenant, with which we are very familiar, does not appear in Genesis 5. It first appears in the Bible in Genesis 6 in connection with Noah. But the concept of covenant is written all over the life of Enoch because he walked with God. To walk with God means to walk in harmony with God, in fellowship with God, in communion with God. So that one can say, God is my God. I follow after him. He gives me everything I require as his child. He loves me and I love him in return. <coughs> This is how a creature experiences the covenant life of God. In God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is this covenant fellowship and life. And God said, I desire to show this covenant fellowship and life to creatures outside of myself, so that they might taste and know that I am good. And thus they experience the covenant. And that in practice means for us, it meant for Enoch, that they walk with God. Enoch must have been outstandingly devoted to God, an outstandingly devoted child of God, because although we have a Genesis 5, a list of the godly members of the church of the Old Testament of that day, of only Enoch do we read that he walked with God. This does not mean, of course, that the rest of them were ungodly. 
but we're really focusing on Enoch in the text. He was exceptional in his day. Remember, we have the two lines in the Old Testament. Cain's line is the line of the reprobate ungodly, the line of the seed of the serpent. And they develop in the way of sin, in one direction. And they become more and more numerous, and more and more powerful, <coughs> up to the point of the flood, when God destroys them all. But we have also the other line, that's the line of Seth. And through that line, God preserves his covenant and his church. But look at Genesis 5, we have this constant formula or refrain. It goes something like this. X lived a certain number of years and begat Y. And the days of X after he begat Y were a certain number of years and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of X were a certain number of years, and he died. That's the formula. Over and over again in Genesis 5, the same formula is repeated. But of Enoch, you read these words in verses 21 to 23. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch not simply lived, but Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Enoch walked with God. That is the thing which characterizes Enoch's life. Now to walk in the Bible denotes one's entire life, the entire direction and focus of one's life. That's one's Walk. It's not just one step in your life, but a whole walk consisting of many, many <coughs> steps. That's your walk. And this Enoch walked with God. Which means that Enoch's life was a constant communion and fellowship with God. It's not that Enoch only fellowshiped with God and had communion with God on the Lord's day or on the Sabbath day. We read in Genesis at the end of chapter 4 that in those days men began to call upon the name of the Lord, the idea there of public worship of the name of Jehovah. Of course, Enoch was there at the worship services on that day. Most likely he was one of the main preachers of that day. But that was not the only time they walked with God. Enoch's walk with God was throughout the week. Every day of the week, every week of the year, every month of the year, throughout his entire life of 365 years. Enoch's thoughts, therefore, were not upon the earth, upon earthly things. Enoch's thoughts were toward heaven. His affections were trained toward God. He lived as a pilgrim and a stranger in the earth. He lived in the consciousness that he was a creature, and more than a creature, a child of God. He loved God and desired to have close fellowship with God, and that's why he lived his life. This was not a drudgery for Enoch. It was blessedness for him. The covenant is not boring. The covenant is a relationship with God. It is the most blessed life that a man or a woman or a young person or a child could ever have upon the earth. This is the purpose for God's creation of us, of man. Remember God made man in his image in order that he might have a relationship of friendship with man. We see that in the Garden of Eden walking with God in the cool of the evening. And then, of course, Adam and Eve no longer wanted to walk with God. They desired instead to walk with the devil. They made an alliance with the evil one and fell into sin, and walking with God became impossible for them. But God promised to Adam and Eve and to all of God's people that he would send the seed of the woman he would restore that walking with God, and every Old Testament believer trusted in 
and looked for that coming seed of the woman who would be Jesus Christ. What did this walking with God look like in practice? Perhaps you might say to yourself, well, this Enoch, he seems like an outstandingly godly person. And he was. I could never attain to the heights of holiness that he did. I've got a job to go to. I've got a family to look after. He must have had a lot of time on his hands for this walking after God. Perhaps you have the idea of a Francis of Assisi type figure. Remember, he was a medieval monk. He sold all his possessions. He lived in the wilderness and he talked to the birds and the animals. And he was supposed to have a very close relationship with God. That's not the way in which Enoch walked with God. Enoch did not flee from human society and live on top of a hill by himself, spending <coughs> all his days in meditation upon God. That's not how we walk with God today either. Rather, Enoch was a husband and a father. We read nothing of his life, but we know he had at least one son called Methuselah, and it says, and sons and daughters. And they lived a long time in those days, they had plenty of time to have many, many sons and daughters. Methuselah had a life which was busy. Also, he had to work for a living. There was no welfare office in his day. He could not sit around all day in idleness. If he had a wife, if he had a son called Methuselah, and many sons and daughters besides, he had to work, and that meant he had to work hard, physical labor in the fields, most likely because that's the kind of work that they had in those days. And so walking with God was not incompatible with a life of busyness as a husband and father, and even as a preacher in the church of his day. So we can walk with God, and we do walk with God, we who believe in Jesus Christ. We walk with God even in all of the mundane tasks of life, whether we are living with our spouse, or instructing our children, or doing our duties in the church, or working in our job, whatever we might be doing, as long as our heart is upon the Lord, as long as we have the attitude of seeking after him and seeking to glorify him in all things, we are, by that, walking with God. It's not just when you're praying that you're walking with God. It's not just when you are doing overtly religious things that you're walking with God. It's not just when you're in church that you're walking with God. We can walk with God today when we do the dishes at home or when we mow our lawn, or wash our car, or tidy our room, or do any other of the mundane tasks of life. We are walking with God when we live in communion and fellowship with God as Enoch did. And in fact, the Francis of Assisi types in this world are an abomination to God. If there is no heartfelt love of God, but merely external obedience and religiosity, if there's no heartfelt love of God showing itself in true obedience to God's commandments. Here's Amos 3, verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And so Enoch's walking with God was to walk in harmony with God, to walk in harmony with God's character. So he lived a life of holiness before the face of God. God is a God who does not love wickedness, who has no pleasure in sin, but who loves righteousness, and he who would walk with God must therefore walk himself in righteousness. And Enoch understood this, and so Enoch walked in a way which glorified God. He was careful to keep the commandments of God. He was careful to live in a way which would please God. He understood all the time he was but a creature of the dust. He was humble in the sight of God. 
He understood too he was a sinner in God's sight, and so he walked in such a way as to retain close fellowship with God. In fact, that kind of walking with God pleases God much more than the so-called Francis of the CC type of mysticism and piety. There are many godly wives and mothers in the church who walk more closely with God as they do all of the tasks of motherhood without complaining in devotion to God and His covenant than professors who write scholarly books which deny the inspiration of the Bible. Enoch's walk with God was also antithetical. Antithetical, which means he stood against something. Antithesis means to stand against the antithesis, which meant that Enoch walked against the world. Against the world. Remember, the world of Enoch's day was growing daily in wickedness before the face of God. Remember where Enoch fits in in the history of the world. And I use that word history advisedly. The Old Testament, Genesis 5, is speaking about real historical people who actually lived upon this earth many, many years ago. We are told in Jude, that short book of Jude, that Enoch was the seventh from Adam which means he was seven generations away from Adam. And therefore, Enoch was contemporary with, lived at the same time as, the earliest patriarchs of the church. Remember, they all lived for many, many years, Adam 930 and the rest in the same period. If you count up the figures, you'll notice this. Before Enoch's translation, only Adam had died. And he had died only 60 years prior to Enoch's translation. Which meant that all of these men mentioned in Genesis 5 were alive at the time of the translation. Enoch could therefore have spoken personally with Adam himself. Perhaps Eve was alive too. We don't know about her, her death. Enoch therefore could have received first-hand knowledge from Adam himself about the Garden of Eden and about the fall and about the mother promise of Genesis 3, verse 15. And at the time of Enoch's translation, Seth was alive, Enos was alive, Canaan was alive, Mahalaleel, his grandfather was alive. Jared, his father, was alive. Methuselah, his son, and Lamech, his grandson. All of them were alive. Only Noah had not yet been born. He would be born 70 years after the translation of Enoch. And then 670 years after the translation of Enoch, the flood came to destroy the world of the ungodly. That gives us an idea of when Enoch lived, when he was walking with God against the world. It also tells us in what kind of a world Enoch was, was called to walk with God. You and I would not like to have been called to walk with God in that world. Because it was a world of terrible wickedness. <coughs> the line of Cain was strong, physically strong in the earth. They were growing at a great rate. They were building cities. They were developing industry and art. These were not cave dwellers scribbling on walls. But all of this, all of this art, all of this music, this technology, this empire building of great cities, all of this was done by the reprobate ungodly out of hatred and opposition to God. All of it was done to serve 
sin, not to glorify God. And at the same time, what was happening to the church of that day? Seth. Seth's mind was gradually shrinking. You have the ungodly, they're growing like a great tree in the earth and their branches are spreading throughout the whole earth. And Seth's mind, that is the line of God's church, is gradually shrinking down to, I remember, eight people at the time of the flood. There are various factors involved in this. There is apostasy. We read in chapter 6 about the sons of God. They are not the angels, the sons of God. They are professing members of the church of that day. And they saw the daughters of men, and that is the ungodly, worldly women of that day. They saw them, and they saw that they were fair, that is, physically attractive, and they were tempted to marry them, and they did. And so you have some of these from the line of Seth intermarrying with the ungodly of the line of Cain, which of course leads to people departing from the church and apostatizing and perishing. There was no doubt that Enoch would have seen some of his own family, perhaps not his children, but his grandchildren, his cousins, and all the rest, departing into the world as they would go a whoring after the wickedness of the world. And so bad did this become that only eight were left at the time of the flood. At the same time, there was persecution of the godly by the ungodly. And the whole thing is summed up in Jude 15 in that one word, ungodly. Jude 15 describes how they were speaking ungodly words and doing ungodly deeds and that God was going to come and destroy them for all of their ungodliness. They lived in open defiance of all of the commandments of God. They provoked God by all that they did. And here we have, in the midst of such a society, such a world, a man like Enoch, who was openly and unashamedly walking with God. Walking in harmony with God against the world. And this, of course, caused the ungodly annoyance and anger that they sought to destroy him. If you walk with God in the midst of a world that walks against God, you are going to be noticed. And Enoch was certainly noticed. He was not the kind of man who walked with God in the secrecy of his house, but he walked with God in everything that he did, in all of his activity, in everything that he did in his life, he showed himself to be a child of God. He would not therefore go with the flow, as the saying goes. He rebuked the wicked for their sins. He refused to take part in their wickedness, and in fact, we read in Jude 15, that he went around the world of his day prophesying against the wickedness of that day and calling them to repent of their wickedness and warning them of God's judgment where he would come with ten thousands and ten thousands of his saints to destroy them. And there's a hint in our text concerning this. Look at verse 5 in Hebrews 11. Enoch was not found. He was not found. And the question is, by whom? Who was looking for him? Well, one very obvious possibility is that the wicked were looking for him. They were looking to destroy him. Remember that these wicked Canaanites were not opposed to murder. Lamech, in the previous chapter, chapter 4, had already boasted to his two wives that he had committed a murder. And you can be sure that a man like Lamech or his sons or his other descendants would have been quite happy to lay hands upon Enoch and to get rid of him because he was, you might say, public enemy number one. The one who would not tolerate the wickedness of the world. The one who would not be silent about it. 
And so they had to get rid of him because he was a thorn in their side. And that's true as well of all true churches in every age and all true believers in every age as well. If you walk against the world, you can expect to receive opposition from the world. And a church that does that, a church which boldly and without compromise promotes godliness and a close walk with God and opposes and rebukes all ungodliness will attract the unwelcome attention of this world. And there's always going to be that temptation, that pressure put upon us. Will we be quiet? Will we tone down our message? Or will we be faithful to what God has revealed to us? Enoch would not be quiet. Enoch would not tone down his message. Enoch was faithful. <laughs> Enoch did not care that the world scorned him. Of course, he was tempted, being like us, of flesh and blood, naturally tempted. But Enoch loved God. Enoch walked with God, and therefore Enoch was not going to deny his God in the midst of the world. Enoch was much like Elijah. Elijah was said to be the one who troubles Israel. Enoch was the one who troubled the whole antediluvian world, the whole world before the flood. And then Noah would take on the mantle, as it were, of Enoch, and he too would trouble that old world before the flood. And so the testimony concerning Enoch was that the world hated him. But that doesn't matter. Because he received a greater testimony than that. He received this testimony in our text. He pleased God. He pleased God. The world might not like us. The world might want us dead. But that does not matter, as long as we know this, we please God. To please God means to be pleasant in the sight of God, so that He delights in us. And here we have the astounding truth. Here we have the Canaanites, and they are growing in power <laughs> in the world. They are building great cities, they are developing great culture and music and all the rest. And God is not at all impressed by any of their works. In fact, he hates their whole business because they are living in sin. They do not please God. Here we have the struggling, very small, persecuted church of the Old Testament. And of them, God says, they please me. And especially pleasing to me is this delightful saint Enoch who walks closely with me. But how is that possible? How is it possible that Enoch would please God? After all, is it not true that Enoch is and was a sinner? Enoch was a sinner. And how can a sinner please God? And how can a sinner walk with God? <coughs> now Pelagius, that old heretic, said that Enoch was not a sinner because there are no sins of Enoch mentioned in the Bible. He had a whole list of people who weren't sinners. <coughs> According to that testimony, Abel was the sinner, Enoch was the sinner, and all the rest. But that is not true. All men are sinners. It's not recorded in the Bible necessarily, but we know from the rest of the Bible that all men are sinners. Enoch knew this. Enoch knew from Adam himself. Adam had told Enoch what happened in the garden, how he had fallen into sin, and how that meant that all men who came from Adam, were sinners. Enoch also knew the answer to his sin was not in himself, in his own works, but in the coming Messiah, the coming seed of the woman. Of himself, Enoch was a sinner, born of sinful parents, totally depraved by nature, a true descendant of Adam, but God had taken Enoch, worked in Enoch's heart, 
by His grace, we generated Him by the Spirit of God and work faith in His heart, so that He became pleasing to God. Enoch pleased God, we are told, by faith. Everything in Hebrews 11 is by faith. Enoch did not please God and did not receive a good testimony from God because of his works. That's Hebrews 1 and 2. For by it, that is by faith, verse 2, the elders obtained a good report. None of the elders, Abel, Enoch, Noah, and all the rest, None of them received a good report from God because of their works. All of them received a good report from God because God engrafted them into Jesus Christ by a true and living faith. And all of them therefore believed in Jesus Christ. Not only in God, in some vague deity in the Old Testament, but in Jesus Christ. Christ. Every Old Testament believer believed in Jesus Christ. And that is the death of all dispensationalism. Because dispensationalism says the Old Testament believers, they just believed in God. They didn't have revelation of Christ. Only New Testament believers believe in Christ. That's not true. Every believer in the Old Testament believed in Jesus Christ. And it's very easy to prove Turn to verse 26 of this chapter. Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And that's true of the entire Hebrews 11 passage because the context tells us that these Hebrews were tempted to go back into Christless Judaism because of all the trouble and persecution that had come upon them for believing in Jesus Christ. And the writer says here, look, if you do that, you're not following in the line of all of the Old Testament believers who are faithful witnesses to you. They all believe in Christ. Don't turn back, but be like them. And be like Enoch, because he too believed in Jesus Christ. And so there only are two possibilities. Either we are in Christ by faith, and thus we are able to please God through the grace of God, or we are trusting in something else, be it our own works, our own religion, whatever else it might be, and therefore we displease God, because the text tells us very clearly, without faith it is impossible to please Him, that is, to please God. That's very clear. Without faith, in Jesus Christ, remember, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible. And where does that leave an unbeliever? In the category of the one who displeases God. And so nothing an unbeliever does, because by definition, an unbeliever doesn't have faith, nothing an unbeliever does is pleasing to God. All of it is abominable in the sight of God, even if he is a religious unbeliever, as was Cain, remember. Cain brought offerings too. He was religious. Nothing an unbeliever does pleases God, because the whole thing proceeds from a heart of unbelief. And so an unbeliever displeases God when he comes to church and sings. He displeases God when he lives faithfully with his wife and looks after his children. When he helps his elderly neighbor mow her lawn or someone to cross the street or gives generously to charity. The whole thing, because it comes to an unbeliever, displeases God. Which is why most of this charity work done by celebrities today is displeasing to God. Because most of those people, if not all of them, are unbelievers. And yet, for an unbeliever not to go to church, and not to sing, and not to hear the word of God, and instead to abandon his wife and children, and not to help his elderly neighbor, and not to give to charity, and all the rest, that is even more displeasing to God. 
you don't have, this is pleasing to God, and this is more pleasing to God, but rather, this is displeasing to God, and this is even more displeasing to God, but there's no pleasing of God except the person who has faith. That's the point of Hebrews 11, verse 6. To please God, one must, as the text says, believe that He is. Not simply believe that He exists, but believe that He is the true and living God as He has revealed Himself in Holy Scripture and especially in Jesus Christ. He must believe that He is the one who diligently rewards the one who seeks Him. Which means He must believe in the promise. The promise. The promise of the Old Testament. Everyone who believed, who pleased God, had to believe in the promise of the coming of the seed of the woman. That's why Cain did not please God. Because Cain, though he came with his offering and so on, was not trusting in the promise of the coming seed of the woman, but was trusting in his own works and sought to please God by his own offering from his own hands and not the Lamb that pictured the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And faith shows itself in this way, in coming to God, coming to God in expectation based upon the promise that those who come diligently to Him, that God will reward them. And that's how he not came to God. He came not trembling and wondering would God receive him, but he came in their confidence that God would receive him because he came trusting in the seed of the woman. He trusted in all of the revelation which he had received. Think of what he had received, right after it all. All he knew, all he not knew, before the Bible was even written, all he knew was that he was created by Jehovah God, that his first parents had received the promise of salvation from Jehovah God that they had fallen into sin and they must come in the way of believing in that promise. But he believed that. We must believe the entire Bible today. He not believed that. He believed the heart of the gospel, which is that the seed of the woman would come, would be bruised by the serpent, and in that way would deliver his people from their sins. And Enoch's testimony is an enduring witness to all ages. Everyone knew Enoch. He was a godly, upstanding member of the church. And the wicked knew him too and sought to silence him. And his name is written in the Bible for us to understand and learn from in all ages. Here was a man who was, we might say, a god intoxicated man. That's how Calvin was described in his day. Enoch lived for God. Enoch loved God. Enoch's delight was in God through Jesus Christ. He's a man that we ought to look to and seek to emulate and not the people of this world who aren't worth our regard. And Enoch's life and testimony were rewarded. We read that in our text. He was translated. Three times we read about his translation. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Translation is a change. A change from one position to another position. We read in Colossians 1 of us being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Enoch was physically transferred from earth where he had walked with God into the very presence of God in heaven and in so being translated he did not see death. He did not pass through physical death. And only one other person in the Old Testament experienced such a thing, and that of course was Elijah. Enoch and Elijah were the two who went to heaven without experiencing physical death. And that too is striking in Genesis 5. You have in there the constant refrain, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. But not with Enoch, it says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, 
because God took him. He did not die. <coughs> he was not, does not mean he died, but that he was taken. Hebrews 11 is very clear on that, that he should not see death. <coughs> and this was a miracle which God performed. Something he did not do very often in the Bible, something spectacular. It's interesting too that Enoch's translation meant that his life was considerably shorter than his contemporaries. Adam lived to 930 years and then he died, which meant that his body returned to the dust and his soul went to heaven. And this happened about 60 years prior to Enoch's translation. Methuselah, who was Enoch's son, he lived to the ripe old age of 969 years. And yet even after all of those years, Methuselah too had to die. And his body too was buried the year that the flood came. But Enoch, you might say, was a short-lived man. He only lived to 365 years, which is young according to the standards of God's day. God took him, we read. God took him to deliver him from his persecutors. God took him to spare him having to see the sorrow of a world continuing to become more and more corrupt in sin. And God took him because God desired to have him with himself. It was not that God cut his life off short in judgment, as he will do with the ungodly. He took him. Here we have a godly saint who is walking for 365 years. And then one day God says, I want him to be closer to me even than this. I want him to be in my very presence. I'm taking him. He's mine. And he goes gone. Gone from this world and gone into heaven to be with God forever. It's an amazing miracle, and yet it's not even described for us in the Bible. What happened? There was no fanfare in the Bible. We can imagine that this must have been a public event, because otherwise people would have said, well, Where is Enoch gone? He disappeared. Perhaps he's died. This must have been something public so that all the people of that day knew that God had taken him. Perhaps he was being chased by the ungodly and then one day God just took him up before their very eyes. And the godly saw it and the ungodly saw it and all of them knew that God had taken Enoch as a testimony to the fact that God loved Enoch and that there was truly salvation and eternal life for God's people. Because here we have a prominent member of the church taken by God himself into heaven. And this encourages the church of that day that there is in fact a reward for the godly. That serving God is not a waste of time. Although it might seem that way from an earthly point of view as the godly are becoming more and more persecuted and the church is shrinking before their very eyes, there is deliverance for the church of <coughs> Jesus Christ. And this is a testimony for us. Proof for us, we who have faith, we who have the confidence in things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen, that there is eternal life, that there is victory over sin and death, Here's one who didn't die. He didn't die. Death was a terrible reality for the church of that day. Death had just entered the world through Adam. And time after time, the people of that day see the horror of death taking away one after another. And here we have one who doesn't die. One who shows that there is eternal life, that there is a place called heaven, that there is a reward for God's people who walk with him. It's not a legend. The ungodly say this is a legend. 
We who believe God's word, we say, no, it's not a legend. It's a testimony to us. It's encouragement to us today. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, Romans 5.12 tells us. But there was one exception. Enoch was translated, but he might not see death. <clears throat> Enoch gives us a picture, a beautiful picture, of what will happen to us on the last day. When Christ comes, and we are translated, we might say, we move from one position to another position. We who have died, our bodies will be raised from the dead, from the dust. Our souls will be reunited with those bodies, and we will be with Christ, and with God, forever in heaven. And so we don't despair. We don't worry about what's going to happen to us when we die. We don't say to ourselves, this constant weariness, this constant <coughs> battle with sin, the world is getting more corrupt, what's going to happen to us in the future? We don't need to despair, because we have this hope, the same hope Enoch had, God will take us to himself. Our calling is simply to walk with God as Enoch did, to walk in close fellowship with him. And one day, when the time has come, when God has determined it, he will say, come. We will come to him through death. We will be with him in our soul. And then when Christ comes on the last day, he will say again, come. And we will be with him, body and soul. And that's our comfort. He will translate us just as he translated Enoch. He has conquered death for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen.